Howdy, this is uh, Dr. John back for another Ask Dr. John segment. And so I'm here and I'm available and um, you can ask any questions you want about anything. You know, uh, Chinese medicine, martial arts, meditation, contemplation, whatever you feel like asking about. If I don't know anything about it, I'll tell you. If I know a lot about it, I'll tell you. And uh, if I don't know a lot about it, I may ask you what you think. So anyway, this is a sharing opportunity where we can all move forward with our questioning. And again, the love of my life, and in my opinion, the most important thing in life is questioning. Uh, many years ago, I mean, many, many, many years ago, I studied with uh, Anthony Robbins before he got extremely popular. Uh, a lot of people don't like Robbins because he did late night TV stuff and he's acts kind of comes across as a huckster <clears throat> and that's fine. And he's really fine about that too. Um, but I worked with him long enough to know that he's the real deal. When he says he's going to do something, he does it. When he says something works, it works. When he trains people, they're trained. And one of the things that Robbins would say is the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your questions. Because it's really the questions you ask. It's like if you get up in the morning and go, oh, God, is this going to be another miserable day? Oh, geez, you know, what's going to happen at work? Do I have to deal with Mary Jane again? Oh, what's going to happen? Am I, is my knee going to bother me, et cetera? Well, I guarantee misery. See, I, I can predict these things. I'm a, a little bit of a prophet in that way. If you get up and start asking those questions, you're going to be miserable because you're asking questions that will lead you to misery. If you get up and say, wow, I wonder what magical thing could happen today. Or what am I most thankful for today? Like, who am I most thankful for today? Uh, what great things could happen? What problems could I solve today, et cetera? Well, you're going to have a pretty good day, almost always, because it's where you're directing your attention. Uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, back in the 60s or 70s, wrote a book on cybernetics, I guess. And in it, he talked about the brain being a goal-seeking organism. Now, I personally think he was a little overly simplistic and a little mechanistic, but a lot of his ideas were quite accurate. Once you turn your brain to a task, it will try to uh, handle that task. It's like Edison said, you know, he would hold a question. He would have an idea and he'd take a cat nap. And often during the cat nap or shortly afterwards, the answer would appear to him. Uh, Tesla said all of his inventions were created 100% in his mind. He never had to do experiments with anything. It was completed in his mind. And so these are people we know about and largely because that's what they do or did in, in this case. And so we can do that too. And one of the key things is anything someone else can accomplish, we have a good chance of accomplishing also. Now, you know, you get a major league baseball player. Uh, I, I'm not going to hit 300. You know, I would, I, even when I was 20, I wasn't going to hit 300. Now that I'm 72, uh, I'm going to hit zero. Exactly. Right. So, you know, there are limitations in that way, but uh, we can either argue for our limitations or we can argue for our capacity. So today I want to talk about a very important subject. Uh, one of the most important subjects, actually, in terms of health. In fact, Stanford did a couple of surveys and said that 90, in one case, 85, in another case, 90 percent of all visits to medical doctors are because of this one problem. It's actually kind of one and a half problems, but they really narrowed it down. And so I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about what the problem is, misperceptions about the problem and misconceptions about the problem, and what you can do about it. All right. So I'm not going to give you a ton of ideas about what to do about it. You can find lots of places to go and figure this out. But I just want to point out some issues with it. So Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. So what do we do about anxiety, right? Good old anxiety. For many of us, it's a friend. It's something that we know intimately. Uh, we've known it since we were children, generally. Very few people start developing anxiety. 
in middle age. It does happen. It can happen for sure. Uh, but often these are things that uh, occurred or we were trained in or we learned at a very early age. You look at families and where anxiety is rampant kind of running through the families. Now, there can be many reasons for that, and I'm going to get into that, but a lot of it is a learned behavior that can be unlearned, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So, so we know anxiety is really troubling and bothersome. You know, anybody, any of you that have had an anxiety attack know it's like you think you're having a heart attack. In fact, it's one of the more common reasons that people go to the emergency room uh, is that they're having an anxiety attack, which they think is a heart attack, right? They're having trouble breathing. Their heart's just pounding in their chest. They're sweating. You know, all these signs that could be a heart attack, but often it's anxiety. And we know that it can interfere with enjoyment. You know, a lot of people that won't do social, like during the pandemic, I had several patients that were totally and completely isolated. The, eventually they would come to see me. But other than that, they wouldn't see their families. They wouldn't see friends. Uh, they wouldn't see coworkers. It was uh, the anxiety and the fear kept them from experiencing life. Well, that shortened their life. There's no doubt about it. The research is quite clear that that level of anxiety will kill you. And uh, COVID was unlikely to kill you. In fact, when you look at the statistics, which are there, if you want to look at them, uh, COVID almost entirely killed people over 70, over 65 years old and with comorbidities. So the staying home, the being anxious, the being depressed actually will kill far more people than were directly killed by the virus. And so we know it can interfere with our relationships. You know, we get short with people. Uh, we get irritable. We get angry easily with anxiety. And we know that it can interfere with our work particularly if it's something where we need to uh, speak with people or do public speaking, et cetera. And it generally, boy, that's an interesting spelling of generally, but it generally feels like it happens to us. And so many things in life in terms of mood, et cetera, feel like they happen to us. And the beginning of creating power is to realize that nothing happens to us in the way that, that I'm talking about here. Anger, nobody makes you angry, ever. Never, ever, ever has someone made you angry. Someone does something that you choose to be angry about. Now, often it's such a quick thing that the incident happens and you flare up with anger. Still, you're creating it and you don't need to create it. And the way we know this is you can get 10 people, have the same thing happen to all 10, some create anger, some start crying, some create anxiety, some get happy, some make new friends. So we know that it isn't the event itself. It's how we relate to the event that really controls everything. And this is true also with most, not 100%, but most anxiety. Uh, and I'm saying most because if I say all, then I'm going to have hundreds of people you know, texting me with nasty messages that their anxiety is a biological or physiological certainty and there's nothing they can do about it. And that's fine. So I'm going to say most. And But what most people don't realize is that anxiety is deadly. It's deadly. Uh, it's not just a little bit bad. It's not like you just lose some sleep. It is significantly worse than many of the behaviors we associate with poor health, uh, breathing bad air, eating uh, ice cream, et cetera. Anxiety will kill you more certainly than many of these bad behaviors. Uh, and anxiety is usually treatable and reversible, but it may take some work to reverse it. Now, the caveat, however, is often it doesn't take much work. Sometimes it takes no work. It's just a matter of choosing the methodology or the treatment protocols and principles that work for you. And I recommend if you're dealing with anxiety that you work on it on your own, but that you also go to a professional that understands the nature of anxiety. And I'm not talking about 20 years laying on a couch uh, doing psychotherapy. I think that's fine. If you wanna do that, that's awesome. There's value there. 
but I don't like that for anxiety. Anxiety should not take long to deal with. This is not a long-term problem. I mean, I'm sorry. It's not a problem that takes a long-term uh, treatment. Okay, uh, so here are a couple studies. And so here we got we have increased mortality among people with anxiety disorders. Now, I just want you to know, I just grabbed these. These are the first two studies that showed up when I put into Google uh, mortality and anxiety. These are the first two studies. There are hundreds of studies. They're all over, okay? Um, some of them give worse odds than this. However, these are the first two I came across. <clears throat> this is from 2018. Uh, anxiety, by the way, is dramatically more prevalent uh, since the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. Uh, huge, huge increases, tripling of the number of anxiety diagnoses and also a similar increase in the number of di depression uh, diagnoses. And again, more people will die from the anxiety and the depression than will die from the virus itself. So, so the risk of death by natural and unnatural causes, that's an interesting one, right? Uh, was significantly higher among individuals with anxiety disorders. So natural mortality rate, heart attacks, stroke, cancer, 39% higher rate of death from all cause versus people that were not diagnosed with anxiety. Unnatural mortality rate ratio, 2.46, that's two and a half times uh, the rate of the baseline for people without anxiety. So this could be car accidents, which is not a natural. It could be suicide. It could be anything that's not expected because of an illness. Uh, those who died from unnatural causes, 16.5% had comorbid diagnoses of depression. I probably won't get into it today. I may. But how anxiety and depression uh, support each other physiologically, how the hormones in our systems, or the neurotransmitters in our system, that once we have been uh, in a state of depression for a certain period of time, that anxiety is much easier to happen. When we've been in state of anxiety for a certain period of time, then depression is more likely to happen. At any rate, here, the MMR, right, which is the mortality rate ratio was 11.72. That means it was 12 times, almost 12 times more likely, people were 12 times more likely to die if they had anxiety and depression than if they did not have anxiety, depression. Now, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you, given that number, think it would be worth getting rid of or controlling your anxiety? Okay, not everybody, but that's a pretty good list. Now, everybody raise your hands if you think it would be worth getting rid of depression. Now, depression is a tricky one. A lot of people that have depression really are not aware of it. And so a lot of people with depression, you know, we look primarily at two different primary types of depression. Now, you know, there's a huge, huge range, a huge gamut of issues, but primarily I'm looking at uh, do you have a lot of negative self-talk? Like I'm worthless. You know, I just screwed up again. Nothing I do works out, that kind of stuff. Or do you have more where you just don't want to get off the couch? You know, it's like, yeah, I have to go to the bathroom and then I need to go to work and I don't want to do anything. I'm just going to lay here, right? So that unwillingness, that lack of motivation. And those are really different issues in many ways. Now, sometimes they go together, right? You you have this negative self-talk. Well, usually it's that you don't want to do anything. You have no motivation, and then you start developing negative self-talk about that. So both of those can occur. In general, and again, this is very gross, the negative self-talk tends to be more of a serotonin issue. And the, I don't want to get off the couch, I have no motivation, tends to be more of a dopamine deficiency. Now, dopamine is the precursor for both epinephrine and norepinephrine. So those are two of the major, 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 major 
anxiety neurotransmitters. Uh, as you know, when there's anxiety, your cortisol levels will go up. Cortisol stimulates the blood sugar system, pulls more blood sugar into your uh, uh, bloodstream, which will increase your heart rate. It will give you uh, greater stamina, et cetera. Epinephrine will directly stimulate your heartbeat. It'll make your heartbeat faster and stronger. Norepinephrine doesn't get as much press. Norepinephrine pulls the blood out of the interior of the body, the stomach, the ovaries, the uterus, et cetera, and pumps it into your extremities, your hands, your feet, and also up into your head so that your brain is more awake so that you can recognize the danger and either fight it or run away from it, okay? So over time, if you're utilizing too many of those hormones for anxiety, you will eventually have low dopamine and then you'll have depression. And so then if you have depression with low dopamine, which is you know just no motivation, I just don't care, I don't wanna get off the couch, let the world pass me by, eventually you're probably gonna develop negative self-talk and low serotonin. So this is, this is kind of the pattern. This is this circular pattern. And if you can break it at anxiety, you're gonna be infinitely better off in your life. So another excess mortality due to depression and anxiety, this is another survey. Persons with anxiety and depression died on average 7.9 years earlier. Whoa, that's crazy. Eating badly generally won't do that. Drinking too much alcohol generally won't do that, uh, et cetera. So these are horrible, horrible, horrible numbers. 7.9 years uh, at a population level, 3.5% of deaths. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot until you run it through the entire population and you re realize that that's approximately 87,000 961 deaths that are attributable to anxiety and depression each year. So the elevated risk of mortality is 1.61, which is a 61% increase. And this is after uh, there's been an adjustment for demographic factors, looking at smoking, alcohol use, sleep, et cetera, uh, where people live. So after all of those, factors, those demographic factors are uh, really accounted for, it's still 87,961 excess deaths. That's a, that's a scary number. Now, is anxiety a fixable problem? I would love for you. Now, if you have any spare time, I'd love you to check out a couple things. Uh, the Amazon on Amazon, their history channel. Now, these two shows are pretty long, but I found them just pretty amazing. Uh, there's one on Theodore Roosevelt, which I knew who I knew very little about. And when you see his life story, it is amazing, just amazing what this man was able to accomplish in the face of horrible odds. I mean, the deck being stacked against him in many, many ways, and he just refused to quit. The other one is Ulysses S. Grant, which has another is another show on the History Channel. Very similar. Their attitudes about life were very similar. Never, ever, ever give up. Never, never, ever, ever give up. And don't experience anxiety. Now, they were clear what anxiety was. They were clear what that way of uh, thinking and being were. And they trained themselves to not have it from childhood train themselves to not experience that. Um, they both had rather difficult childhoods and they were traumatized deeply. And, you know, um, a, a lot of times people will use that or not get over that trauma. Roosevelt and Grant did and went on to live very, very fulfilling and powerful lives. And a couple others, and these are just for fun. Uh, the Roosevelt and Grant ones are, I think, are are quite telling and and really great stories for life. These other two on Netflix are just fun ones. Any of you who have seen Galaxy Quest, the absurd takeoff on Star Trek, uh, and in there it talks about Grapthar's hammer 
But basically the idea is never give up, right? That's their, there's, it's much longer than that, but there's a saying they have, which is really cute. And, uh, I think worth watching. And the other one is one of my favorite scenes in a movie. Now, this is from Bridge of Spies. And in this movie, the main character is a man named Abel. Abel is a spy, and he's caught red-handed spying for the Soviet Union. And he, the, the Soviet Union, the Russians disavow him. He's not an American citizen, and he's uh, very likely going to be tried and executed for treason. And Tom Hanks is his attorney. Now, several times during the movie, this same type of scene occurs. Uh, but I'm going to play one of them for you. How did we do in there? Uh, this is after a hearing. Too good. Apparently, you're not an American citizen. That's true. And according to your boss, you're not a Soviet citizen either. Well, the boss isn't always right, but he's always the boss. <laughs> Do you never worry? Would it help? I love that line. Would it help? And those of you that have experienced anxiety, particularly severe anxiety, no, realize it never helps. It never helps. It pulls you out of the present moment it puts you into fear of some future event over which you have no power other than to run away and hide at the moment, right? But throughout the movie, as he's facing death here, it's like, would it help? No, I don't want to die. No, I don't want to deal with any of this, but would it help to be anxious? And of course, the answer is no. So if you are, do suffer from anxiety, I would recommend you get treatment and self-treatment as soon as possible so that you can get past that so that you can live a more powerful life. So resilience. Resilience is a superpower. So people that have resilience. When you watch uh, professional sports, one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot, like if you're watching football players, you know, what's, what's his completion percentage as a quarterback? What, you know, is, um, what's his win-loss record? But if you listen to the coaches over and over, and particularly the 49ers, who I, you know, because my wife is an acupuncturist for them, and because I have been a fan for 50, 60 years, um, I pay attention to what's happening. And this coaching staff that they currently have, I believe, is one of the best coaching staffs in football ever, at least one of the two best on the 49ers. And over and over again, when you hear their interviews, they talk about resilience. Now, they may use other terms, but they're talking about resilience. And so they drafted a kicker this year, and they got a lot of flack for it because they drafted him pretty high. And kickers usually aren't that important that you, you, know, that you spend a lot of capital on them, but they did. And it turns out, after the fact, they actually scouted, interviewed, watched 27 kickers before they decided to draft the kicker that they did. And one of the things that just really stood out to them is when they went to the pro day, that's where um, the scouts go to the college and watch the players uh, do whatever they're doing. When they went to the pro day for this kicker, uh, he had two horrible centers, the person that hikes the ball to them and they were bouncing it and rolling it and it was just a nightmare but instead of giving up instead of saying oh my god i can't do this this is unfair this is unfair uh he just kept kicking and that was the most important factor now he had a good leg he kicked really well he was very accurate but what pushed them over the top into drafting him with a premium draft choice was his ability under pressure his resilience. When things went bad, he got tougher. He didn't get anxious. He didn't panic. He just went about his job. He focused. Instead of focusing on what could go wrong and what had gone wrong, he focused 100% on what it was that he was attempting to uh, create. What was the job that he was there to do? 
And so this ability to adapt and overcome adversities and setbacks and emerge stronger, right? And so that's a, the superpower. Now, I call it a superpower for several reasons. Uh, most people that you see, read about, that have done great things in the world had the superpower of resilience. They didn't all have it made. I mean, that's a, a old wives' tale, a story, you know, different types of privilege. And some people do have more privilege than other, but nobody makes it without resilience. I don't care who, who you are. I mean, you get people that come from billionaire families that fail miserably. They're in drug rehab all the time. In fact, that's probably more the norm than the exception. The people coming from those very privileged environments often do the worst. So along that line, there are several studies that show that optimism predicts greater health and longevity. And this one study that I was looking at was even in cancer patients. Patients with cancer live longer, more often kick the cancer, and it went into um, remission, and they had greater happiness in their life when they were optimistic. Now, this is, I'm talking about rather unreal optimism, okay? And so they divided people into three categories, the pessimist, the quote, realist, and the optimist. The pessimist saw the glass is half full and oh my God, it's never gonna be more than that. We're gonna run out of, out of whatever the drink is really soon. And the realist, it's like, well, it's half full and okay, we'll see what happens. And the optimist, it's half full. Isn't that awesome? You know, and they're looking at all the positivity of it. So some people call that unreasonable. I call it resilience and a superpower. So be willing to look a little silly sometimes and be optimistic. So the glass is half full. Uh, so positive thinking. And here's, this isn't a, a woo-woo thing. This isn't something that's like way out there. This is solid science. Believe me, it's solid, solid. Positive thinking increases dopamine, right? One of the, the, the primary reward chemical, it's the thing that is one of the primary or the chemical that's one of the primary causes us of uh, our having enthusiasm, of our having energy to take on projects, of our getting joy out of finishing projects, serotonin, uh, which tells us that we're loved. It helps create relationships. Uh, and then oxytocin, which is the lifeblood of intimacy, right? It's what bonds mommy to baby while, while baby is nursing or being held. It's also what bonds couples. If you look deeply into someone's eyes, for a certain period of time, it increases oxytocin. And then love happens, or closeness happens, or attraction happens. Sex, uh, men who have orgasm have three to four times the oxytocin increase. Women that have orgasm have also have an oxytocin increase. It's not quite as dramatic. Um, I didn't make up the rules. But so you get increases in dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and those ever, ever loving endorphins, those chemicals that make you feel good, that create the runner's high, the workout high, et cetera. So all of these get better just, just from looking at things differently. Oh, look at that glass. It's half full. Thank God I was really thirsty. And now I get all of that liquid that I can drink as opposed to, oh God, you know, I really wanted two glasses and I'm only getting half. This is this hor is horrible. So the great lesson of life is never give up and to be optimistic. So polyvagal theory, I'm not gonna go into, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, vagus means wanderer. Uh, as the vagus nerve wanders and connects to most of the organs of the body, when people have problems with digestion, when they have problems uh, with heart rate, when they have problems uh, with uh, the bladder functioning property, et cetera, et cetera, often that's a problem with the vagus nerve. Now, it's what puts you into a, a parasympathetic nervous system state. Now, for many, many years, uh, the nervous system has been divided into two primary, and there are many ways you can divide this, but one of the ways of of dividing them is into sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is your fight or flight system. It's like, whoa, let's go, let's do this, let's work. Uh, uh, in that system, in the sympathetic nervous system, one of the things that doesn't occur is healing. 
You don't heal when that system's turned on. That's the system that is to get you out of trouble. You run away from the uh, villain. You work really hard at your job. You get angry with your neighbor. Okay, those are all stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, but no healing happens. The parasympathetic, para meaning alongside, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is where relaxation occurs. It's where uh, deep sleep can occur. It's where healing of the body occurs and almost all healing. Now, if you cut your leg, you're gonna get blood clotting happening to stop you from bleeding out but it's not really healing. That's an emergency activity. Uh, but the healing to heal that wound mostly happens at night when you're in this parasympathetic nervous system state. And in uh, neurology, it's stated that nerves that fire together, wire together. So the more often you have a group of nerves fire, the more often and the easier they will learn to fire. Okay. So this happens with post-traumatic stress disorder. As bad experiences are relived, they get stronger. Now, most things get weaker over time, Most like memories. I don't remember anything that happened when I was in fourth grade. I mean, literally, I can't remember a thing from fourth grade. I remember a couple of things from third grade because I like my teacher. But fourth, no, I don't remember anything. But if I'd had a traumatic experience, around which I developed post-traumatic stress disorder, I would remember vividly. I'd remember it in my body. I would remember the trauma and it would get stronger rather than weaker because those memories are firing nerves that fire together so they wire together. So if you wanna stop having that, you need to start stimulating a completely, a totally different set of nerves so that you get a firing of the vagus nerve and or the parasympathetic nervous system. And this can be done. There are many ways to do this. And the more we use it, the easier the pathway is to access. When I was training martial arts, um, when I was serious, I mean, really serious about it, I was going to fight in tournaments. And my teacher, um, who was an incredibly compassionate man, would beat the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. And so what he would do you know, is he would start punching at me and I would dodge. That was my job. I would dodge his punches and he would start punching faster and faster and faster. And I would dodge faster and faster and faster. And eventually I'd reach a point where I couldn't go any further. Now that wasn't true that I couldn't go further. It's just that I reached a certain place where I was willing to give up. And so he wouldn't stop hitting me. OK, it's like, I'm done, you know, leave me alone. No, he's going to keep hitting me. So eventually I started dodging again. And over time, I realized that that place I was quitting before was very early on in my stress and that I could go way beyond that, way beyond that before I would finally feel overwhelmed. And finally, I got to the point where it was almost impossible to overwhelm me. So that was the training. The training was how do you go from being easily overwhelmed and anxious to not allowing that to be the case? And for me, it was a physical and emotional training. Now, I'm not saying go out and let someone punch you in the head, but there are many, many ways that this can be done. Um, now, with polyvagal theory, that's a newer theory advanced by Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. And th there are a lot of people that dispute it. They say it's too simplistic. But I'll tell you, there, there are some truths to it. There's some stuff that's in the ballpark. And he said that there are really three parts to the vagus nerve issue and not two. It wasn't just uh, the parasympathetic, which is social, safe, rest and digest. This is where your food digests. And mobilization, which is fight or flight. And in fight or flight, there is no socialization. You do not feel safe. Your food does not digest and you don't heal. He said there is a third part to that system, uh, which I'm not going to go into the details. There's an anterior and a posterior. But in here, it was shut down. And that was immobilization. So we're talking about fight, flight, or freeze. And many people felt that freeze came first. Uh, that was the first thing. When, when there's no movement, it's much more difficult for predators, whether they're human or other animals. It's much more difficult to see you, particularly at night. 
Night vision is designed to see moving objects much better. Daylight vision is, is a little different. So the first thing is freeze, and then you fight or flight. And when everything is safe, then you go back to social and safe or the parasympathetic nervous system. So the point is to train yourself to move from fight or flight or shut down to rest and digest and parasympathetic nervous system. Now, I have seen this happen in 15 minutes. I've seen people train this. I've seen many people train it in an hour. Um, I was certified by Anthony Robbins many years ago. I mean, uh, practically centuries ago, at least decades ago. And what he was famous for, what he first became famous for was going on TV. And it's been a while. I think it was actually Oprah and doing um, phobia cures. He would have people come out who he didn't know. And they had some phobia like tarantulas. And on screen, live on Oprah, he would work with people so they got over their phobias in a matter of minutes. I'm, I'm talking minutes. Now, I've seen him do this with many people, many things. So I know that this can happen quickly. So you got to get over the idea that it's happening to you, that you're creating it, that it can be fixed, and most importantly, that you need to fix it. 7.9 years off your life. That's a long time. So, you know, if the average person goes on statin drugs, okay, they've had a heart attack, they go on statins, they're religious about it, right? The average increase in lifespan, average, is four days, okay? Four days from doing your statins or 7.9 years from getting over your anxiety. Trust me, it's well worth it. So possibilities, acupuncture, the number one thing that we treat in acupuncture over the last decade is, drum roll please, anxiety. We treat anxiety every day. There are body acupuncture points. There are ear acupuncture systems very effectively. Herbs that will help. They won't retrain you though. They can help calm things down while you're getting retrained. And some of our herbs are practically magical for that. A variety of supplements that are also very effective. And you may know a lot of them, L-theanine, GABA, et cetera. Uh, there are many of them. Nutrition. One of the things that we see is that people that have certain types of malnutrition are much more like, and this is subclinical. This isn't, these aren't things that you would go to your medical doctor for nutrition problems. This is kind of borderline or barely low uh, zinc issues, copper zinc uh, ratios, uh, ferritin levels, things like that can have a big effect on anxiety. Um, so nutrition, meditation, ultimately, that's going to be your savior. Uh, EFT, emotional freedom technique. EFT is an offshoot of, of acupuncture and then acupressure practices. Uh, it's often called tapping because you're tapping certain points or points along the acupuncture meridians, typically repeating something, not a mantra, but like a mantra as you're doing it. And this can be incredibly effective. One of uh, Catherine actually mentioned she knows somebody very well who had severe anxiety around an issue, did one session of EFT with an accomplished master EFT practitioner, completely got rid of their anxiety. And it's never, this has been years and it hasn't come back. So EFT can be very powerful. I'd recommend that the first time you do it, you go to a professional. After that, you can practice on your own. I recommend doing it daily. Uh, start reading books or watch or listen to programs about perseverance, okay? It can be quite moving to your soul. A slow immersion in distress. Don't dive in head first. You know, start building up with all of these techniques and then start slowly working, generally with a professional, into immersion, into uh, more stressful situations. Now, we do this all the time. I had, I think, three or four patients today whose primary issues were around anxiety who are now almost completely free of any signs of anxiety. And of course, because that of that, they sleep better, they're happier, their relationships are better, their bowel movements are better, uh, pretty much everything is better because the anxiety level is gone down. 
and then cognitive behavior therapy. So this is a form of uh, therapy. You'd see a therapist, you know, a psychologist. And it, with cognitive behavior therapy, it's generally pretty quick. They're going to give you a set of tools. So when situation A arises, what do I say to myself? When situation B arises, what do I say to myself? So here you have a lot of control over the process. In fact, through most of these, you have a lot of control over the process. Uh, any of these can work. I recommend if you have even slight anxiety, right? You know, you don't like public speaking. You know, the phone rings and you get a little freaked out. You get a letter from the IRS and, you know, your body, you start sweating and, you know, it, it's horrible. So any of those things, I recommend that you get treatment, one of these treatments or something else for that. You'll be happier. You'll be much healthier. You'll live longer and you'll be a lot more fun to be around. If you have questions about anxiety or programs or any of these things I've mentioned, uh, please send them to us and I'd be happy to go into more detail at either our next uh, session or one of our future sessions. So I want to thank you for tuning in and being here with us. I want to thank Catherine for doing the lighting and the recording and really handling everything. The only thing I do is sit here and talk. Everything else she's doing. So I want to thank her. And so until next Thursday, be happy, be healthy. Bye-bye.